Hello everyone, this is Criminal Profiler Pat Brown, and today we're going to look at the, how many years is it now? 28 year old case of uh, Jody Hoosentrout. Uh, she was a news anchor, a morning news anchor, and who went missing in Iowa. And the case has never been solved. And this is a popular case among people because it just, it's one of those frustrating ones, uh, like what could have happened? Why is nothing, why has it never been solved? And I'm going to explain during the show why it's so tricky, all right? Uh, because it, I, I had actually not been willing to do this show for a really long time. I've talked about it in Hangouts, um, but to do a full show on it, I was like, but there's issues with this case. And a lot of the issues are misinformation, misunder misunderstanding, and just missing any kind of information. <laughs> you know, in other words, there's no access to police files. There's very little in crime scene photos. Um, I, I even question what those crime scene photos are. So I'm going to get into all of that with you. First, I want to welcome everybody who is here in the chat room. I think I've welcomed most everybody so far. And we've got a pretty full chat room today. Let's see who I've missed. I think I've got everybody. But, oh, Nini, I haven't said hello to you yet. Anna, Anna Maria, I haven't said hello to you yet. Uh, good girl. I like that name. Good girl, I haven't said hello to you yet. I think everybody, Loretta, I haven't said hello to you yet. <laughs> I say hello to everybody before the show, but sometimes uh, people, like, they fly in as the show begins. Um, if you'd like to be in the chat room, by the way, my chat rooms, uh, we have uh, uh, eight shows a month with a, a live show with uh, the chat room. And if you'd like to be in that, um, it is patron only. So you go to the link below in the description, you click on Patreon and you join for five bucks a month and you have eight shows, you have four hangouts and four case shows a month. And we also have a community, which we chat in. Join, it supports this educational channel um, and it really makes a difference uh, for keeping this thing going. Uh, if you don't wanna do that, you don't have to because every one of my shows is available to the public. Um, and you just, please subscribe to the channel, uh, click uh, like, um, click the bell for notifications. And also, I say this all the time, go to the, the search in Google, uh, not in Google, go to the search in YouTube and put in Profiler Pat Brown in any case you're interested in and see if I've done it. Because uh, many times I've been asked, have you, I wish you'd talk about this case. And I said, well, I did that two years ago. And I sent over uh, the link. But you can find the link yourself or you can go to my playlist and just roll through them. And there's a lot in my playlist, uh, different cases that you might be interested in. Other ways to support the channel, I have my books below. Only the Truth, by the way, I haven't talked about this in a while, is it's $2.99 at Amazon. Um, it's a wonderful, oh, did I say that? I'm the author. <laughs> That's kind of wrong. But anyway, <laughs> a lot of people like the book, and I love my book. I do, I do. It's, it's a psychological mystery. It's $2.99, and you can click below and enjoy a good book. And send it to somebody for Christmas. Um, also, there's a little dollar sign, which is, a thanks button. All right, that's enough. Um, it's it's been a, a bad week for me because my last show that I put up, they they for whatever reasons have uh, demonetized it. Go figure. Anyway, I want to get to the case. All right, this case. Mm. All right, <laughs> Jody Husentrut. Uh, I have a lot of feelings about this case for a number of reasons. One is she's originally from Minnesota and I, I lived in Minnesota for four years. And she she had actually, one, one of the things she had hoped was she could work for a WCCO, which is which is the main channel out of um, uh, Minneapolis. And for four years that I lived in Minnesota, I uplinked to all my shows out of the WCCO building. Um, and so I know all the people there. And so it has kind of a meaning for me. Um, also, I. I've been on TV for many years. I, you know, I was on TV for over 15 years. I did 3,000 appearances. So I understand what it's like to be in the limelight, the public limelight, and what that can mean as far as any kind of dangers go, because I have been stalked. Um, uh, and we don't know that she was stalked, but I can tell you I have, I've been stalked uh, quite a number of times. Oddly enough, mostly all by women. <laughs> I guess, I don't know, maybe it's because I was in my 40s, so I don't know what it was, but women stalked me, not men. Go figure. Anyway, um, uh, most of them are kind of 
people who fell in love with me. Um, and one was a crazy uh, private investigator who wanted to take me out of the business and replace me. And that's a whole big story. But I know what it's like to be in the public eye and you start getting these things that could put you, you know, in danger from people who see you because you're out there all the time. And they have their, and certain people with personality disorders or uh, they, they, they see things in a different way. They envision things. They start having delusions about you. Like, oh, you know, even here on YouTube, <laughs> not you guys, <laughs> but you see me, I talk to you and now you get to know me. And actually some of you have gotten to know me very well and you're my friends. But then there's other people who have different ideas about what I mean to them. And so, so I understand as, as she was a, a morning news anchor, she wasn't in a big area, um, but those people in town knew who she was. She was very, she was a celebrity in their town. Um, and I, I understand how that, all of that works. I want to, I want to point out something to you in that, that vein, as far as news anchors go. Um, I have a news anchor in my family. It's my, my nephew's wife. Um, she was a news anchor in uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico. And now she's a news anchor in, in Denver. And, um, well, that's a bit, let me find her here. Here she is. And her name is Nicole Brady. You can see she's a very beautiful woman. She's now a Denver 7 weekly weekday morning anchor. And here she is in the studio. Uh, and there she is. She's lovely. And I know that uh, Nicole, um, she's very well loved by the community because when you when you do local news, especially back in 1995 when she disappeared, um, people didn't have so much of the 24 hour a day CNN, MSNBC, Fox, all that crap going on. They had their channel, uh, the local channel, uh, usually one of three, um, and they'd wake up to their morning anchor and, and he felt close because that person lived in your community. They weren't somebody else in New York city. Uh, they were, they were in your community. They were part of your community. They raised their, they, they were, they were either born there or they had moved there or they raised their children there. Um, so they're, they're there and you can meet them at different places. Sometimes they'll do, uh, events in the local community and you can go up and say, oh my gosh, hi, hi Jody. And you can meet them uh, because they're not distant. And so when you're a local uh, anchor, especially a morning anchor or an evening anchor, uh, you do become very, very noted in the community, very noticeable in the community. So I, I want to point that out. I, I understand that from my own work and from my I never know what you, what do you call your, your, your nephew's wife? Is it your niece? I, mean, I never know what to call them. <laughs> but anyway, she's family. And so, um, and she was extreme. She's extre was extremely popular in Albuquerque. Now she's extremely popular in Denver. She's lovely, but she's out there all the time. And she, she too has family and children and, and wonders whether, you know, sometimes, you know, she's, she's very visible, shall we say. So that is uh, one of the reasons this, this case, one, I lived in Minneapolis for four years and she came from Minnesota um, and she was interested in working for WCCO. Among other places, she was hoping to move on to a bigger location in Iowa. Um, she was at the KIMT uh, station in, in Mason City, Iowa, not a big place. And what happens is, and lot, I wanna explain this before I go further, a lot of people do not understand that you don't make a crap load of money being an anchor in a small location. You know, people always think about somebody who's on the Today Show. Uh, they have their own show like Nancy Grace and they're making a, a whole bunch of money. But 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 news, news, news per persons, um, reporters, for example, reporters in local communities, they look at they, they make minimum wage. It's a crap job. But they love their work. They want to be journalists. So they, they do that, but they make garbage for money. And then if you're lucky enough, you can finally move into an, uh, being on television. You'll make more. You might make $20 an hour. And, <laughs> and I'm talking about today's money. And I'm not talking about 1995. And then you could be a news anchor. And today's new an news anchor, I looked it up. 
it's running about in most locations twenty six dollars an hour. That's not great, <laughs> you know, and and you know she was oh was she's twenty I believe she was twenty seven years old when she went missing. She had worked herself into getting that position. I'm, I'm pretty sure she made crap money. All right. I want to point this out for a good reason, because I'm going to talk about where she lived in a bit. But she wasn't making great money. And so there's there's reasons why this plays into how she managed her life. Uh, she wanted to move on to a, a, a bigger location, uh, which every every news anchor wants to. And it's a very tight field. I mean, in other words, everybody wants to go to L.A. Everybody wants to go to New York, Washington, D.C., Atlanta, Georgia. Everybody wants to go there. And so every person who is an anchor in a smaller town, smaller city, wants to move on to something bigger. It's very difficult. You know, the the, the world of TV is, is rough. But she had dreams, and uh, fortunately, they came to an end. Um, but I'm going to talk. So, so I wanted to point out that was another reason that, you know, I, being around TV, being around uh, uh, news, I understand where she's coming from and what her what her interactions are with the community. Uh, one more thing I just want to point out uh, is <laughs> this is just a, a silly personal thing for me. Um, where's my picture? Mm, okay, got, I'm trying to find my picture, but it's so darn small. It's always hard when the, the pictures are so tiny you can hardly see them. Um, she drove a Mazda Miata. She had just gotten this this uh, about four weeks before she disappeared. Uh, she had uh, bought, but she hadn't really. It was a weird weird arrangement. She was going to be paying paying for it, but it hadn't all the stuff, all the paperwork hadn't gone through. People make a lot of this, but it's all nonsense. No, nobody who had this who sold her this car had anything to do with their disappearance. But she loved this Mazda Miata. And so, somebody said, well, why would you buy a Mazda Miata? She lives in Iowa. You know, it's like it's cold. Um, it's a crappy car for the winter. And, and they're absolutely right about that. Um, because, and I know this personally because, this is my picture. No, oh, where's my picture? Oh, my God. I swear to God, I had this picture up. And you know me and my picture issues. <laughs> and a lot of the problem is that, hold on, I'm going to find my picture. Seriously, I am. Mm -mm -mm. Give me a minute. Where'd it go? Where'd it go? Hold on. Where'd my picture go? Oh, here it is. <laughs> I had to block out the, um, the the license plates numbers because I didn't want that being tracked. Is that blocked out? Oh, crap. That's not the one. <laughs> Where's the one with the blocked out one? Hold on a second, guys. I'm so annoyed now. I, I, I purposely put up the blocked out one so that people couldn't read my license plate number. Maybe this one. Oh, now I'm just going to give it all away. <laughs> I say I can't see. Aha. Whew. Okay. <laughs> uh, somebody's going to take a screenshot and they'll come after me, but let me know. Let, let me let you know you will not make it past the gate. Anyway, you can see my car out there. It's a Mazda Miata and it is a convertible just like hers. Um, and I've had this since 2009. I absolutely love it. And I live in Maryland. And let me tell you, in the winter, it sucks. You can't drive it very well. It, it, it doesn't hold the road at all. Uh, and so if you don't have a second vehicle, you just don't, don't go anywhere. But she was hoping to go to another location. So was she buying this as a thought of... I'm going to get a better job someplace else and it's going to be warmer and then I can zip around. Or did she just love zipping around on the back roads and saying, well, in the winter, she only, by the way, her, her apartment was only, this apartment was only five minutes from the studio. So, I mean, seriously, she could drive five minutes with this car, no matter what. So, but that was, those are the kind of reasons that this case has resonates with me in a kind of maybe a silly way, but it's Minnesota. It's, it's the news business. It's, it, it's, it, it's the car and, um, and the issue is about stalking and, and being in the public eye and all of that. So I just want to point that out before I start. Um, and before I go on, I'm, I'm going to check out some of your comments in a second, but I want to tell you where I got some of my information from. Uh, there was a book out um, that I wanted to buy but unfortunately, I found out it wasn't on Kindle, and I didn't have time to get it shipped in. So I did I did read a tiny bit of it on Kindle, and the woman actually said, and Pat Brown says, and I'm like, 
Oh, I'm in your book. Maybe I should have gotten it. <laughs> I don't know if the book was great or not, but um, I got enough information from elsewhere, so I have not ordered it. But um, I appreciate her writing it. So where did I get my information from? I will point out places that I like. Oh, that's, that, that's not what I want to point out. Okay. <laughs> Trace Evidence, Episode 46, The Abduction of Jody Hoosentrude. Uh, I've always liked Trace Evidence. I, I, Trace Evidence is one of those channels which I generally approve of. I don't find that, that he is any kind of a grifter. I find that he explains things very well. I, I not, he sometimes interject some opinion, but I, I don't find it offensive. And I think he, he gets a lot of good information in there. So trace evidence, I will recommend that channel. I've recommended it before. Um, and I'm very, very, I have very few channels I recommend, but I like trace evidence a lot. So I'm recommending trace evidence. I think it's a good channel. So here it is. I'm going to put it in the link below. All right. Also, I did watch this. Um, this was News Nation, which sometimes I'm not fond of. But anyway, um, this was what happened to TV anchor Jody Hoosentrude. This came out a year ago. And I thought it, I'm going to link that also. I thought it was a pretty good explanation of things and brought in some information that I thought was very interesting. And they also featured this woman. Her name is Carolyn Lowe. She is an investigative journalist. And I mean, a real one. You know, these days, I'm not fond of journalism. I think half the people are just hacks. And they, they, they don't care about the truth. They don't, they don't quote you properly. Carolyn Lowe has to be one of the best investigative journalists I've ever heard. Um, so kudos to her. Everybody respect her. I'm completely amazed by her. And so she's in this. And you can hear the way she speaks on this case. She knows how to do her job. And she does it well. Um, so I really, really like her. Uh, there's another uh, place you can go find information. It's called Find Jody. I think it's findjody.com. Um, and they have the all, all these podcasts on there, including the one with uh, Caroline Lowe. Um, uh, she, Caroline Lowe is uh, featured quite often. And there's also this thing, uh, one of the podcasts has a retired team of FBI profilers who analyze the case. And it's interesting. So if you want to get all stuff, um, I'd go there. My only complaint is I wish they would have... Um, uh, a transcript because I'm a little, when I try to get information, sometimes it just feels very slow to me to go through podcasts and I wish I could just whip through them. Probably people think the same here, but the, there's so this really good stuff out there. And I, I suggest you go check that out uh, after before, if you're interested in checking that before, if you're coming here later, you're not here live, check it out. Come back to my, 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 um, uh, my, my video or just watch my video and then go check out what I had to say about those. I'm going to check your comments before I go into the whole story. Now, um, well, let's see what comments we have here that I want to point, point, uh, look at, um, that, that this is a good point. Uh, Sarah, people have a sense, a sense quotes of knowing her through the familiarity of TV. It's true. I mean, when, when you see somebody over and over again, and they're talking to you and they're explaining their lives and explaining things, if it feels like a friend. And for most people who are <laughs> not psychopaths, that's a good thing. I mean, that's one of the reasons you know one does one does what they do. One is a journalist and reaches out. Um, a reason I do YouTube, I, I I like people who I can communicate with. But then you got those a small percentage, and they take what you say differently. They, they see you not just as somebody that, oh, I, I know, I, I like watching that person. I can, I understand her. I feel like a friend. They, they think they are your friend. <laughs> it gets concerning. They think they have a relationship with you that is far deeper than it could possibly be. It becomes delusional. And so that is a danger for some people um, who are in the public eye, actresses, singers, um, and TV anchors. Uh, that that can be that can be problematic. So, um, let's see uh, what else you said. Uh, uh, Harper says even more stalking like this is happening now. This is true in the social media times. Yeah, um, because it reaches out to so many more people, and and people have asked me the same question. Um, what do you feel about being on YouTube? Uh, and and I try to protect certain aspects of you know. Who, who, 
of uh, you know where I am and when you can get to me. And I let everybody know that I'm high, heavily armed. <laughs> My daughter lives next door. Police. So anyway, you know, it, but you know, it's it's a concern. But it, what I want, I'm going to get into why why this isn't isn't a concern. Both sides of it for for Jody Houston Trude. Um, let's see. Um, I don't know why you're talking about Patty Duke and Kathy. <laughs> I have no idea what this has anything to do with anything, but I want to say something about this because my name is Pat. When I grew up, everybody called me Patty, which I always hated. And then they sang that stupid song. If you know Patty Duke, you know something. And I didn't like Patty. I like Kathy. I wanted to be Kathy, who was, you know, her twin, I guess. And I wanted to be Kathy because Kathy was sweet. You know, in the long run, I think I'm Patty. But, you know, I'm just so annoying. <laughs> All right. Let me let me get to the story. All right. Jody Hoosentrude. She was born in 1968. She was an American news anchor at for KIMT in Mason City, Iowa. She disappeared in the early morning hours of June 27th, 1995. Um, after soon after telling a colleague that she had overslept and was running late for work. I'll get into this whole time frame thing here in a minute. Since there were signs of a struggle outside her apartment, this was the apartment. This is a modern picture, but I'll, I'll show you the pictures of the apartment then and now, because this is also very interesting. But here she, there was a, she, her car was parked about the, somewhere in here. And I'm going to, I'll show you better pictures. Uh, that they believed a, um, the struggle was outside her apartment. She was believed to have been abducted, absolutely 100% abducted. Uh, however, extensive investigations failed to uncover any clues to her disappearance. Yes and no. I'll get to that. Um, and and Houston Truth was declared legally dead in 2001. Well, clearly she's never been seen in, what is it now, 28 years? She's not alive. She was probably not alive within a few hours or a few days of her disappearance. So definitely she, somebody murdered her, which is horrific. What they did before they murdered her, we do not know. We just know she was abducted and at some point murdered. All right. Now, as to her disappearance. All right. Uh, the day before her disappearance, and I'm reading this from Wikipedia, uh, Hussentrut uh, participated in a golf tournament. And I want to get into some of her personality things. Um, she was a very vivacious woman um, and loved to be out in the public. And, and some people say, well, that put her in danger. But, you know, if you actually look at how many um, people on television and radio and all these, all these, they go out in public all the time. They're very, very uh, involved in the community. Most of them don't get killed. So that's sometimes over-exaggerated, like, well, if she hadn't gone to a golf tournament, she wouldn't be dead. No, 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 no. That's just, that's, that's just being silly. Because we don't know where, we actually aren't entirely sure, I'll get into that, why she was abducted and murdered. We just know that for whatever reason she was. And, we, and people are trying to assign different reasons for this to be happening. I think a lot of times it's just nonsense. It's absolute nonsense. So anyway, she had, she had gone to a golf tournament. According to Mason City resident John Van Sice, this is a fellow who is a top suspect. Now, let me, let, me, um, let me show you a little bit more about this. Hold on a sec. Okay, so we have, uh, uh, the, oh, this is, this is just Jody. This is Jody in, in the studio um, doing her morning show when she could. Uh, and this is... Joe Van Sy, uh, sorry, so his name, what, where's his name? I forgot it. Um, John Van Sice, sorry. This is John Van Sice. He, it, it, he becomes the number one suspect. And I'll explain to you why I think in the eyes of the police, he still is the number one suspect. Um, or, and why it may be that the poor schmuck just has really been screwed in this whole thing. She knew this guy named John Van Sice. He lived in, in fairly nearby her, like a very short distance away, like under 10 minutes. Um, she supposedly went to this golf game. And then he claimed that she, after the golf game, he went to her house because he had held this party for her. Well, actually, her friend was supposed to be doing this party for her. And a friend, like, 
bugged out and said, hey, John, can you do this? And he did. And it was videotaped. So he said, stop by my house. I want to show you the videotape. It's a 17 minute videotape. So supposedly he claims she went to his house, saw the tape and then went home. All right. And this is him, by the way, with, with the ladies around him. He was, how old was he? I think he was, I'm trying to find where, it's not here. He's about 49 years old, um, about 20 years older than her. He was recently divorced within the last year. Um, and he had a reasonable amount of money. And he had a boat and he took the, he took her water skiing, but always with friends. So he like, I think they met in a bar someplace and he was like getting into the single life, you know, his, his, since his marriage was over, he was dating a woman, his, actually his age, which is shocking. Um, <laughs> any woman understands what I'm saying. Anyway, so Apparently, Jody was also hanging around those bars and they met and she became part of this kind of group. And 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 he liked her, he says, as a daughter. Um, and she was never really alone with him. She had always her friends and going on the boat and, you know, water skiing and stuff like that. And like a friendly, happy group. And it's hard to say whether he was just one of those guys who just loved to be around people. And he had nothing, he had no nobody said he had any, they ever saw him do anything toward Jody that was question, questionable. Like, like he was kissing up on her or he was trying to get her alone or saying thing. Nobody said he did any of that. He was dating somebody else. And, uh, you know, could a guy of his age want a girl 20 years younger? Yeah. He, he said he thought of her as like a daughter. I don't know if I believe that. Cause pretty much I know a lot of guys in their forties who would be perfectly happy to have a 20 year younger wife. And she was a she was a celebrity. So was he just loving it, the being being part of this gang and the celebrity status she had and all that? It's possible. There was a claim that he uh, named his boat after her, and and people thought that meant he actually painted her name Jody on the boat. And he, that never actually happened. Supposedly he just I think he just said I'll call my boat Jody. I was joking around, you know, um, because she was she was a celebrity in the town. She was the new the new the anchor, um, and she was pretty and fun and bubbly. But he said he was, there's an interesting point here. Uh, he, but when he talked to the police the next day, he supposedly made a statement, I was the last person who saw her, meaning that after the golf tournament, she came to his house, saw this video and went home. Spent, he lived very close to her. So she dropped by theoretically. This is all theory because we don't have the police reports. Um, and it's, it's hard to tell where the truth is. But she watched this little video, to, you know, and he was like, oh, this is the video we did of your birthday. And and then she went home and she did go home, mind you, because I'll get into why, you know, she she didn't show up the next day. But she was her her um, producer called her in the morning and she was she was in bed sleeping by herself, apparently. So it's not like she didn't you know, she didn't go home. She did. But the next day when he was like talking to the police, he said, well, I'm the last person to see her. And there are some claims that he said, I'm the last person to see her alive, which would be more concerning because why would he say that? But here's the beginning of, I have no clue how much of anything is true in this case. This is where it gets tricky. So as a profiler, when people ask me to profile a case, how do I do that without access to the police files, access to real photos, access to anything that I know is the truth. And I'll show you some more examples of this It's crazy. So anyway, he said she came by the house and then she went home. Then what happened next was this. At about 4, 4 a.m. Uh, on Tuesday, uh, June 27th, 1995, producer Amy Coons. Amy Coons is, let me show you a picture of Amy. This was her producer. Um, let's look at a decent picture of Amy. Hold on a second. There we go. Amy Coons, that was her former producer. Uh, she was at the studio and she noticed that Hoos and Trude had failed to report to work as scheduled. She was supposed to be there at 3.30 in the morning. That's a horrible time. I know I've been, I've done much work early in the morning for news. And she called her apartment. When Hoos and Trude answered the telephone, she explained that she had overslept and that she was preparing to leave for the station. I want to point this out. She was in bed. Sounded groggy going, oh my God, I overslept. Uh, shoot. Now, I'm, I'm, always, I'm always amazed when people oversleep because I've done a lot of early morning crap for TV. 
I set two alarms. I make damn sure that I'm there on time. I would never take that chance. How do you oversleep when you're the morning anchor? I don't know. But then I wasn't 27. When I did, you know, maybe it was, maybe I had learned a few lessons in life. So anyway, she said she had overslept. She was preparing to leave for the station. However, by 6 a.m., she had still not arrived. So Coons filled in for her on the morning show, a, a morning show called Daybreak. So Coons just jumped in her position, did her show for her. Then seven o'clock comes along and they're like, where the heck is she? She was supposed to be on her way. Now, it's kind of interesting here. They called the police at this point to do a welfare check. I, I don't know why I find this weird because they, the studio is five minutes from the apartment. I don't know why they didn't send some gopher over there to say, hey, jump in your vehicle, go down there and find out what's going on with her. In fact, they called the police. It's just kind of weird to me. But I, I don't know. Maybe they didn't have any gophers available. <laughs> so they sent the police to do a welfare check. And um, they arrived at her apartment, Houston Jude's apartment. And they found the, a red Mazda Miata in the parking lot. That's her, that's her vehicle, right? It's in the parking lot. But the problem is she's not in the house. She's not in the apartment. Um, and next to the, the Mazda Miata, they, there was evidence that a struggle had occurred there. Uh, her personal items, including a bent car key, were strewn about the area. And the police reported recovering an unidentified palm, pre palm print from her vehicle. That, that's, that's later on. They did recover a palm print and a hair, but never matched it to anybody. And the police have never known whether that palm print or hair had anything to do with the, the abduction. Why? Because, you know, people got, got in and out of her car, friends and so forth. And, and some people claim that friends were never actually checked for their palm prints. That's bad police work. But also, it's a parking lot. You know, you're getting your stuff out and you press, put your hand on the car. You know, yeah, handprint on a car is not necessarily meaning that's the abductor. But they found her stuff strewn up around the car in a bent car key, which indicated she put her her car her key into the car. And when the key was in the lock, somebody attacked her enough to cause the car to bend and then drop. So they were pretty sure she had been abducted. Uh, they went into her uh, uh, apartment and they found nothing out of place. There was nothing. There was no sign of any violence there. She definitely was not there. Um, and she clearly had left the apartment because she had taken a hair dryer. Um, uh, let's see. What, what, what did she take with her? This, this all gets very, this gets a wee bit confusing. Uh, again, I don't, I wish I had a, a list of the things that were found in the parking lot, but it's a little screwy. Um, supposedly her high heeled shoe, a car key, earrings, and a hairdryer were all found on the ground. All right. So uh, there's a lot of theories about this. Like she's run rushing. Obviously she's rushing to go to work. She leaves the, the apartment, um, and she's rushing to the car and somebody attacks her at the car when she's putting the key in the car. I mean, there's really no question about that. The, uh, the, the uh, mirror here is also bent that direction so somebody pushed her uh somehow and her key came bent out of the lock and she whacked into the the mirror and there's some drag marks theoretically i'll show you some pictures of that um that's this is the location that's her car this is the this is the apartment um they're they're taking the car away here this is a key on the ground now i want to point out i have no freaking clue it, this is this is supposed to be a crime scene photo. I really I'm not sure that it's accurate, but and this is a shoe next to the car. This is supposed to be a, a, a hair dryer, um, and this is supposed to be like if she were grabbed her shoe going the high heel shoe, and that's the hand of the 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 somebody pointing out. Hey, look, there's these drag marks. Okay. Um, what I can say is this, there's no question that she was attacked at the car. Uh, there's a question whether she had a, a bag with her stuff in it. Uh, it seems she was wearing the shoes because why would the shoes be dragged? Why would there be heel marks if she wasn't wearing them? I believe she was wearing them. Um, 
sometimes people wear, you know, if you're going to go to a metro and you're going to walk to your studio, you put on tennis shoes. And then when you get there, you change into something you know, fancier. But if you're five minutes from a studio and you're in a rush, you might just pick up your shoes, put your feet in them. And then you're going to grab. Now, the question was whether she took a shower and her hair was wet. And there, that's why she had the hair dryer. Now, that's what a lot of people think. Um, do I believe that? I don't know. I mean, I, well, I've arrived at studios and if they don't have a hair and makeup person, I have to freaking fix my own stuff. And, and, and <laughs> in smaller venues, they pro you probably have to do your own makeup and hair. Um, and so she might have had a purse that she grabbed that had makeup already in it. They never found a purse. They never found uh, her wallet or anything. So I'm sure that went with her and that person, whoever took her. Um, but she might have grabbed on her way out. Uh, the hair dryer, some hair, uh, some, 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 they say there was hairspray. I don't know if that's true, uh, but something and some earrings, uh, because that's what you might grab as you're running out. You're going to jump in your car. It was 12 steps to her car. I mean, she's right in front of the bu building, jump in the car, chuck that stuff in your front seat, drive five minutes, grab your crap up, run in, throw some earrings on, blow out your hair. Even if it's not wet, you might use the blow dryer just to, to style my opinion. Uh, and so I don't even know she would waste her time taking a shower when she's already late. That just seems silly to me. Um, there was, there was a statement that her bed was made, but that supposedly that's not true. It's just like the blanket was thrown up. Uh, some people have said that, oh, maybe there was somebody overnight with her. And after she left, they like, like made the bed. <laughs> Who does that? <laughs> you know, if I were a dude, I'm like, well, oh, she's dumped me. I'm gone. <laughs> but anyway, I don't know if she had a bag or she didn't. Uh, some theorize, uh, I've seen uh, uh, one of the FBI profilers on the, uh, that particular site, which I linked below, believed that she had a bag, which she dumped in these things. And then when she was attacked, um, the bag went with her, but things fell out of the bag. Eh, possible. Does it matter? No, <laughs> quite frankly. It's one of those things you can ruminate over, but who gives a crap? She, and I don't care if she had a bag or she didn't have a bag. The problem is she ends up abducted and things end up in the parking lot which just shows she's been abducted that that's all we really know now let me show you something this is why you gotta be careful about anything that you see you see that shoe here so the shoe i don't know if this is this is supposedly the real crime scene photos so you have one shoe i've heard there are two shoes is there one shoe or two shoes if she's wearing them on her feet she could have one could have been knocked off and the other one could have gone with her into the person's vehicle but let me show you some crazy stuff. Uh, and this is why you got to be really careful when you're, you're dealing with uh, stuff, shall we say. Um, let's see, where's my pictures? Oh, yeah, here we go. Okay, now here is here is a picture of the vehicle. <laughs> this is supposed to be a Mazda Miata, and there's her stuff strewn on the ground. Well, don't you see, do you see, do you see a purse on the ground? Well, I've never heard there was a purse on the ground. And I see a shoe, maybe two shoes, one next to the car. But here's the problem. I'm looking at this picture going, do you see the white line above the car? That is a solid curb. Now, I want you to take a look at this picture. You see that? There is no solid solid curb in that parking lot at all. There is none. Let me, let me, let me show you some more places of where this occurred. Uh, hold on a second. Um, and I'm trying to find it. Mm -mm -mm. Let's see. What, what picture do we have here? Um, I want to trying to figure out which one I want to show you first. Let me show you this. Uh, uh, can you see that? I think you can see that. Uh, oops. Wait a minute. Hold on. Ah, forgot to click that off. You see, this is the parking lot. Everyone, it's, it's these little cement things that go in front of every car. There's not a solid cement line across at all. That's nonsense. It doesn't exist. And so, the problem people have is that they see a picture. Look at this picture I just showed you. Um, that's a fake. This is a fake picture. It doesn't. I don't know who put this picture together, but it's not true. Somebody drove their Mazda Miata there and threw some crap on the ground. But that is not true. That does not exist. Then I saw this picture. This was this one's from the Sun. Now in this particular picture, we have two, two, uh, two. Two of the shoes, both the shoes are there and they've got these, you know, these, these numbers by them as a crime scene would show. And they do have separate, those little separate cement blocks, but there's, 
first of all, there's two. Uh, secondly, the between two, they're in between the um, the parked cars where the cement blocks are on, in front of each one of the cars, and there's dirt. Now, <laughs> here's here's the problem. Let's go back. Let's see if I can find a picture back here. All right, there's a, there they are. Um, first of all, there's no dirt. There's a cement lot. There's no dirt in between those 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 uh, dividers, those cement dividers. There's no dirt in between them. So where did this dirt come from anyway? <laughs> I'm going to say they made that crap up. Somebody put shoes down there and put probably the sun people put some. I don't think that's true. So here's the problem. We hear what was left in the parking lot. And quite frankly, I have no idea because the, the supposed crime scene photos are crap. And then I've got these fake photos, which I think are also crap. What I can tell you is this. This is the location. This was the place she lived. This was the parking lot that she came out to. Her car was parked about this spot here. Um, it's interesting. This parking lot has, um, if you see here, there's, is, there's three buildings. One building here. There's one building here. And there's one building here. Okay. And over here, the, the, this is the main road. You come, you cut you, what you do is you, hold on a second, you come in here, it's one way, this way. And as you see, all the, the parking uh, spots are straight. And you come around here, and now you can't see because it's, it's the wrong season. You come around here, and every, all this parking spaces are on an angle. And so there is, there is room to come around this spot. And here's a picture here uh, where that trash truck is, is the area where you, if you're coming down this way, you can turn the corner and then park on an angle. And so she had to come in over here, go down here, go around the thing, and then park on an angle. And this is important as far as where would somebody grab her because it's pretty clear that somebody had to have a vehicle to take her away, all right? And I'll get into that. But in, in order to do so, he had to be able to be somewhere in this lot. He could be theoretically here while she was here, um, except that supposedly when she came out of the building, 12 steps to her car, she was putting her keys in. Somebody supposedly dragged her this way, actually this way toward this Avenue, which means that they, they had to pull her around the car theoretically. And I don't know how true that is either, quite frankly. Um, so where was their vehicle at? Was their vehicle you can't really park the vehicle. We see what the trash truck is. I, I, I can't figure out because I can't see the, pro, the lot well enough, whether you could park here and people could still, could still get by because if you could park here and people could still get by, then that's a good place to sit while you wait for her to come out of the apartment and then grab her because she was grabbed from behind or she was putting her key, you know, key in the car and somebody came up and attacked her right there. I don't know if they hit her over the head. I don't know what they did to her. I don't know if she remained conscious or un she went completely unconscious immediately, but then they dragged her. Uh, I don't see it. I kind of think she was unconscious because um, I don't see lots of things strewn about or um, many, many you know, footprints. I think she might've been out and they dragged her and then maybe picked her up and then chucked her in to a vehicle. But where was the vehicle? And that's going to be an interesting issue as far as this location goes. Um, so she's, let me, let me put another picture to you. Um, it's one without hopefully as much, uh, <laughs> much trees covering the stupid lot, which is very annoying. Um, let me see. What is, that's the one I already had here. Uh, here's, here's a picture. This is just an interesting picture of, uh, out, out the street, but somebody, they, they said that, well, somebody had to drive out of there and then go someplace uh, as far when they drove out. Um, they, if they drove, I think this was South, there's a church right here, but not much else. And if they drove North, there's pretty much nothing right across from her place is a church. There's a church here and there's a church here, a church directly across from the parking lot. I will take that into consideration. Because if somebody was stalking her and she went, I don't know where she went to church. I couldn't find any information on that. Which church did she go to? Did she go to a local church or did she go to a faraway church? I don't know. Can't find that information. Uh, but there are psychopaths who, who love to go to churches because that's where they can get women. 
uh, because I think the women are more kind. <laughs> they don't have to go to a bar and try to impress people. They can say, I'm here because, you know, I, I'm, I'm proving my life and I want this and that. And there's sometimes church ladies who, you know, are, are, are hoping to meet somebody themselves, a, a Christian man. And if they can pretend to be one, they can get themselves a lady, but they can also get themselves like interested. They can become obsessive about somebody. And this, this church was right across the street. I've never heard about anything about any, um, any investigation of any of the churches in the, the, the local area, especially the one across the street, which is somebody who could actually watch what was going on where she lives. And this is going to become important. So, uh, so where she lived, let me show you a couple more pictures. Um, where she lived, uh, let's see, mm -mm -mm. that's where she lived. You can see see what I'm talking about, the three different uh, parts of the building. Uh, there's a there's a river that goes there, the Winnebago River. And if you look over through those through all the, the, the trees, you'll see a campground. And there was some interest in that campground. Like, could somebody from that campground have come over and done something to her? Well... Uh, the campground, I looked to see if anybody lived there permanently. And apparently they only, it's a, it's a government run one and they, you can only be there for 14 days. And there was a, like a reenactment, a civil war reenactment thing on the weekend. But uh, I find it I, unlikely that somebody passing through the area would, would crawl through the trees and then spy on her to figure out when she's leaving in the morning. Because she, after all, she had, there was only like, 30 seconds. She walked 12, 12 steps from her, from, let, let me show you this picture. She comes out of there. She's on the second floor. She comes down the stairs. She walks out at now for, she's supposed to be out at 3.30 in the morning, but she's not. And so she's out after four o'clock and rushing to her car. How would anybody have a freaking clue that she was coming out of that building and walking 12? Look at us. It's 12. 12 steps to her car. And I don't even know if that's true, but 12 steps to her car. She was, she was from the building to her car in a heartbeat because she was, she was in a rush. We're not even talking about her lolling around. How would anybody have a clue that she was leaving that building at that time and going to her car, even if they were sitting there just, Oh, well, I wonder, I wonder if that um, woman's going to come out. They would, they have to tack her at the car. How did they get there that quickly? If they were at a distance, they wouldn't have been able to get out of their vehicle and go attack her. Um, so somebody had to be literally right there at like right, right there at the building. Uh, or there had to be somebody who was uh, had to be a duo, somebody driving and the other person was hiding there. And as soon as she came out, and went to the car, he just rolled right up and grabbed her and then chucked her in a vehicle. Th that's. That's the only thing that's possible. However, I just don't think somebody from the campground has accidentally rolled in at that time and saw her come out and go, oh, Eureka. <laughs> and besides, which I don't even know if he'd have a vehicle because his vehicle is parked at the campground. So there was a very, very short time frame that anything could happen in. And looking at the location she's at, um, oops, let me, let me go through some of these pictures here. Um, let me find it here. Here again is a good picture. This is, this is a modern day picture, but you can get a feeling of where she's in that parking lot. Uh, essentially. Um, I don't believe anybody came out of the woods and dragged her away. They said that her, the drag marks went toward the, what you're seeing in front is the street, the main street. They're saying it went toward that main street, a North Kentucky street. I don't even understand why they, I don't even understand where the drag marks are supposedly. Again, we have a lack of information, which leaves us in the dark. Um, but I do not think she was dragged into the trees. So therefore somebody had a vehicle there. Um, the question is, where was the vehicle? Uh, and I'm going to show you a couple possibilities there. This is another interesting view viewpoint of it. Um, so you can see the, 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 how the cars are parked. That's, that's modern day. Um, this is also modern day. I went on, uh, I think it was Google maps of, and, and a few different sites to get these pictures. That's Kentucky Avenue that goes by. And you can see there the, you see the slanted cars. You can see that quite clearly. That is the part the campground. Um, where's the one I want to show you? 
Oh, where'd it go? Hold on a second. Let me find the picture I really wanted to show you, which I'm hopefully is still. <laughs> hopefully I didn't lose it. Uh, me and my lost pictures. Um, let me go back here and see what I can find here. That's that. That's what happened to my pictures. Ah, crap. Oh, here it is. But that's not the one I wanted to show you. Oh, it is. But um, this is uh, on this side. Okay. I had a better picture of it just so you could see it big. But okay. This here is Jody's car. This is the entrance of the building. So her car would have been probably, see, now if you look, this is important. If you look at the, see those little cement thingies. I don't know what you even call those things, <laughs> cement thingies. Um, the last one she could have parked at would have been this one. Uh, I don't know if she was parked there. I don't. Uh, I don't know if she's parked here or she was parked here. She couldn't be parked here because that's where, remember I told you you had to come in here and you have to go around and you have to come around and you have to go this way. Um, but if you're parked here, if the person was parked here, the question is, could somebody just sit here, have enough room for people to go around them? Like, you know, if you're around here and you're going around, you could, I think you could probably park here, but I can't see under those stupid trees. Uh, and then when she goes to her car here or here, that person could jump out and grab her. Or the other possibility is, let's say she was parked here but the killer was parked here. The abductor was parked here. She goes to her car. He's standing. He's like on his vehicle right here. She, she, he's standing behind his vehicle. She comes up here. He just runs around his vehicle, grabs her, drags her a wee bit, chucks her, chucks her into the side of a van or, you know, some slide door and then takes off. That's one possibility. However, there were some, there was a, there are supposedly two people who saw a white, white van. Now here's where you get run into problems. Did they really see the white van? What day did they see the white van? This this didn't come imme immediately, so it's questionable. One person said they saw a white van here. Now, you see, this will be at the end of this, right near the street, okay? But if the person's parked over here, that's a long way to drag somebody. Maybe they carried her. Um, but I would think, somebody said they saw it with the parking lights on. I would think if you're going to abduct somebody, I don't know if you want your parking lights on, but okay, you're sitting here ready to go out, possible. But I don't know. I just I wonder then if there's two people because one person that's behind the wheel, one person that's over here grabs her, carries her, chucks her in, and they take off. Would you leave a vehicle there with the parking lights on and do it by yourself? Maybe. Somebody else said they saw a vehicle up here, actually on the road. That's a really long freaking way to carry a body all the way over there. I don't believe that one at all. So if I'm going to believe one, I'm going to believe the white van here. But then again, this guy supposedly reported a week later. Did he really remember the day he saw the white van? Maybe it was not even that day. Um, yeah, maybe not even that day. And white vans, let me tell you about white vans and white trucks. White vans and white trucks are used by incredible amount of businesses. So a lot of people, whenever you have a, like something that goes bad, you always say, people say, I saw a white truck. I saw a white van. No, they did, but it had nothing to do with whatever happened. Uh, there was during the um, DC snipers. I remember that there was a gas station. Somebody was shot in, and people said, oh, it was a white truck there that zoomed off. Well, you know, if I'm in a white truck, a business, you know, I'm, I'm, I picked up, I've got my gas for the morning. I'm off to my job, whatever job I have on white pickup. And I hear gunshots. I'm putting my foot on the accelerator. I'm getting the hell out of there. <laughs> that, that's not unlikely that it's a completely innocent person. But white vans and white trucks are often claimed to be involved in these cases because there's so many of them that businesses use. And that's just a simple fact. So I don't know whether the white van see, seen here had anything to do with anything. It could be somebody who parked here. It could be somebody who parked over there. It could be somebody who actually lived in the complex who just had their car right there. Don't know. All we know is she was abducted out of that parking lot. That is the entire thing we've got on that. I'm going to check some of your comments and I'm going to get to the actual apartment issue, which has been an interesting thing. Uh, see them every day. 
<laughs> tons of them. So it's really hard to say if they're involved in anything. They never did identify um, any particular one. They did say that nobody at this complex had a white van. And there were some 80, 73 apartments, I think it was. Um, so that nobody had a, a white van. Okay, that's interesting. Um, uh, Lila says, Iowa has a lot of small towns. The Iowa CID helps small Iowa towns that do not have resources to properly investigate high profile crimes. Where were they in this case? Have no clue. You know, we're talking 1995. Um, and when things happen, here's what people always sort of overlook. When, when a crime happens like this, the local PD, that is their jurisdiction, they come in and they work the case. Everything depends on the detectives in that homicide department. They could be highly qualified. They could be guys who just were pulled off the street. And they were like street cops a week before and they have no freaking clue what they're doing. Most detectives in homicide never get training. That is a fact and I, people do not get that. I am fighting for that change. Homicide detectives come from the street. They're good at what they do and or they drink with the right people <laughs> and they become homicide detectives. They do not go to homicide school. They do not spend three months. Now, often to become a police officer, you go to you go, go to police, you go to the police academy. But that teaches you how to deal with people on the street. It doesn't teach you how to analyze crime or homicides or any of that nonsense. It's it's what you do on the street and following protocol and all that. So then when you're on, oh, one day they say, you, you're going to move you into robbery. We're going to move you into child abuse. We're going to move you into sex crimes. You just move in there. They don't send you to school. You just learn on the job. And that's one of the reasons we have detectives who are well-meaning, but not necessarily well-trained. I don't know who got this case. I don't know if they did a good job or they didn't. But the problem is they had two possibilities. Well, they had three possibilities in this case. I'm going to talk about the three different possibilities. One is good old Van, Van Sys, um, the, guy, the older guy who was the last one to see her maybe alive, that guy. He became the number one suspect for good reason. And then there's a possibility of a stalker because she was in television. And yes, you can get stalkers in television. And a stalker, here's one of the things about this particular case. Let's, let's go back and look at, just, just, just look at the the building coming. I uh, just want to, where is it? Okay, right here. Let's look at this picture. If she's only got 30, 12 steps to her car and she's not even there at the right time, who is going to abduct her at that moment in time in the small apartment complex? Somebody has to be there. Somebody has to know she is there. Somebody has to know she comes out at that time of day. This is not this is not the same thing as, let's say you've got a, 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 a um, you're at the mall. A woman leaves the mall. Stores have closed, nine o'clock, stores have closed. They walk to the parking lot. Their car is quite a distance because they spent dinner, they had dinner there and everything. Their car is at a distance. The lighting is crap. There's nobody around. Their car is like, yeah, they're walking, walking, walking to their car. Some guy driving along goes, some serial killer goes, hey, there's a woman over there. Nobody around. He grabs her. That that is just pure luck. Now, mind you, he might have actually he might have actually been circling around that mall for days looking for his lucky moment. That's true. But this is kind of a crappy location to look for somebody just to show up at three or four in the morning, a woman to come out to her car. I don't think many people left at that time. Of the early morning hours, most people would leave at six in the morning, seven in the morning, eight in the morning. And there's only 73, I think it was 73 houses, uh, apartments there. A good portion of them are probably guys. So how many women are going to roll out at three to four in the morning? Somebody knew that this woman was coming out. Now, I want to talk about this apartment complex because this is one of the things that just irritates the crap out of me. All right, there, there, there's this claim that she, let me let me just show you let me show you um, the modern uh, let me go back to just a more of a modern day picture of this place. All right, 
let's just oh, where's where's the one I wanted to show you? Uh, where'd it go? There we go. Okay, this is a modern day picture of this. Uh, I want to show you this for a good reason. So, people, some of these profilers came out and they're like, "Well, how safety conscious was she?" Because you know, this building it didn't have any it didn't have a guard. I'm like a guard. <laughs> a guard? This is a freaking guard. This is a garden apartment. There's no guards in garden apartments. <laughs> That's not what guard and means. A garden apartment is usually a most of the time, at least when I was when I was out there, is a lower income apartment. And I've looked at this apartment today. It's only 500 bucks. <laughs> and it's not that nice. All right. $500. I don't even know where you get it. I mean, usually you usually have to go to the projects to get $500, but it is Iowa. So, okay. Their, their costs are cheaper. This is not a fancy apartment. She wasn't making good money. She was not. She was a news anchor, but she was making crap for money. She lived alone, which I know that when I was in my 19, 20, 21, I have always had a roommate. I couldn't even afford a crap apartment alone. I had a roommate and some really bad roommates. If you all had roommates, you know what I mean. You advertise for a roommate and then you get stuck with that roommate and it's all hell. Um, but that's, and people, sometimes girls will get together, guys will get together and they rent an apartment together and, and that's how they split the rent. This she got, she had a one bedroom, I think. Uh, and it's not an expensive apartment. It's not that great. So you got a lot of people living here who are, I'm not saying they're bad people. I'm just saying they don't have money. <laughs> There's no guard here, for God's sakes. She wasn't lacking concern for her safety by because there was no guard here. She just she didn't have enough money to live any place fancier. She was living like every other young woman did, living in a garden apartment in 1995. It's not a big deal. And then they made this huge deal about that she didn't always close her blinds. So people could see if she was walking around because she has a second floor apartment like right here. They could see her walking around. Okay. She had a one bedroom. I'm going to say her bedroom blinds were closed when she was like sleeping, when she was doing whatever she was doing in there. But yeah, what? She wanted to keep her blinds closed like 24 hours a day so she never saw the sun? I'm pretty sure. I have my window. I don't even have blinds. My windows don't even have curtains. <laughs> I love the. I love light. So you can see. But, you know, my my bedroom is off to an area where it's got trees around it. Uh, my my living room, if I'm sitting on my couch, I can wave to people. Yeah, I can. I don't care. I want light. She's living in an apartment. She's not going to close her blinds 100% of the time. She's going to open up her windows. and She's not lacking understanding of her safety. She's living like every other young woman. Now, some people say, well, she should have closed her blinds because when she got up to go to work, Clearly, they saw that she was, the lights were on. You know, when you're blind, you can still see the freaking light, you know, <laughs> around the edges and stuff like that. You know somebody's up. And then you see the light go off, you know they left. Yes. They make all this stuff up about how she handled being in this place. No, she was a normal young woman who lived in a garden apartment, going to a car, not so, expecting because nobody else was being uh, dragged away and, and, and kidnapped out of the damn lot. She assumed she could walk tw 12 steps to her car, open up the door and jump into the darn thing. Except that that one day, for whatever reasons, somebody was ready to get her and somebody had to be paying attention. This is not, this is not some crime where, you know, it's just happenstance that she was walking down a street toward a, uh, toward a bus stop and some guy just grabbed her off the street. No, somebody was watching. And they had to watch quite often. She wasn't even at the right time today. So she, somebody had to sit there and wait a longer time to get her because she didn't bloody well wake up on time. Somebody was waiting that amount of extra time. So this is either, this is somebody who really wanted to abduct her, somebody who had been paying attention. Uh, and the question is then, who was it that was paying attention that would sit out there and wait for her to come out. So this one moment they could actually grab her. So that's an important thing to understand that there was nothing she did could have done any differently. 
uh, you know, have any knowledge that anything was going wrong. Now, mind you, there were some people talk about, she did file a police report that eight months prior, and it made people make a big deal. This was eight months prior. She saw a white truck that she thought was following her and she filed a police report. Um, but it was just one police report. And she never saw it again. It was eight months prior. I don't know if it has any connection to this crime at all. And, and, and to make too much of it is probably to make too much of it. Um, she saw it one time, apparently. Otherwise, she, I think she would have been like writing down the license plate number. Um, I don't know why that freaked her out that one time. Maybe she just, maybe some creepy dude was just going, hey, baby. You know, like that doesn't happen to him. I mean, I can't remember how many times people have <laughs> had cars follow me. I remember one time I was out in California and I was wearing a little, little cute little sundress. And I, this car was like going behind me, like really slow, like slow, slow. And then the car came beside me. And then the guy looked over and he saw that I was like nine months pregnant. And he went, Vroom! <laughs> he took off. I'm like, ha ha. You know? <laughs> it could be that simple. She did report it. They never, nothing ever came of it. It was eight months prior. I don't know that has anything to do with anything. So, um, but clearly somebody did plan this. This was a planned abduction. This was a person who knew exactly when she came out of that location. Somebody had to know her habits. And that is really, truly fascinating. So I'm, now I'm going to go to the suspects on this. But I wanted you to understand the, the apartment uh, and her, her behavior and how it all went down. I'll check your comments and I'll go to the suspects on this. Um, oh, the toilet seat issue. I didn't get to the toilet seat issue. Okay, I wanted to point this out. All right. The police went into her apartment and they found some things some people say were interesting. One was that the toilet seat was up, which could mean that a male was in her apartment. Now, mind you, when she when her, when her her producer called her in the morning, she was all groggy and she was like, "Okay, I'm on my way." Theoretically, could there have been a man in the apartment? Yes, that used the toilet. Yes, it's possible. But you would have to believe that after having a nice night with her, he followed her out and then kidnapped her. Does this make sense? And he never came forward, blah, blah, blah. I don't know. I and That he never came forward, I could sort of see because you don't want to get yourself in trouble. But there was really no evidence there was anybody else in the apartment. Uh, she was tired when she when she supposedly went, after she went to John's house. That's John, right? I always forget his name. I am having an issue with John. Um, I'll make sure I have his name right. Um, uh, John Van Sice. Is this name John Van Sice? You know me and names. I can't remember any of them. Let me find John. Is it John? John. <laughs> John Van Sice. And that's Ann Cruz. All right. That was her producer. And that's the guy. And that's his boat. You see, they're all hanging out. Anyway, John said he was the last one to see her at her, his place. But then when when uh, Cruz calls her in the morning, she sounds groggy and says, oh, mama, way. Uh, there's no evidence that John went home with her and was sleeping in bed with her. But Theoretically, could that have been true? But if he got to sleep with her, why is he going to get up in the morning and kidnap her? <laughs> you know, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. So the question about the, the toilet seat, some say, well, maybe she was cleaning. Well, I would say that's kind of unlikely. She was. She came home from the golf. She had been out all day. She was tired. She had to get up, supposedly, by 3.30 in the morning and didn't. Do you think she's going to be cleaning her toilet at 11 o'clock at night? I doubt that. So why is the toilet seat up? And the most logical explanation, unfortunately, is we don't know that when the police came to the place and were examining everything, one guy didn't have to take a leak. Dudes are like that. They walk in the bathroom, take a leak, and then leave the seat up. So it's it's very, very possible that it was simply the police did it. And therefore, it never happened. I want to point out another thing somebody said about, let's see if I have that picture. <laughs> Do I have the picture or don't I have the picture? Eh, I don't know. Where's my picture? Uh, probably don't have the picture. Uh, it's just it's just a simple picture of, um, it was a picture of her dish drainer. Let's see if I can find it. Um, hang on. Is that it? Let's see if this is it. You don't know how small these pictures are. You're like, I have to guess what these pictures are. 
Ah, oh, crap. Okay, ignore that. So she had a dish drain. <laughs> she had a dish drainer. And there was like a, a, a like a, I think she had a Coke there. Like she liked to drink that. I don't know what she liked to drink. And then there was some, another, another can, <gasps> you know, like if there's two different, two cans and one is one brand and one is maybe a beer. Oh, she must have had a guy over. Well, don't ever come to my kitchen because I'm a diet Pepsi drinker. No, I need some of that now. <laughs> I'm a diet Pepsi drinker. Does that mean that I would never drink anything else? That I would never have like, like there's a, there's a place right down the street from me, which is um, has IPA beers. They're from, they're a Maryland local IPA person. And sometimes my daughter likes to support them. And so she'll get a bunch of them and she'll give me a few. Um, and there's different flavors. It's like mango beer and all kinds of weird stuff. Um, but I like to support the locals. Could I have had, maybe. I had some, I, ran, I had some soda and then I said, oh, I think I'll have this. And then I put the can down. Does that mean there's two people here? <laughs> that just means I like to drink things. What if there's two plates in the sink? Oh my God. Two plates in the sink. <coughs> Sorry. That must mean there's two people. Maybe I just don't wash my dishes well enough. Maybe I ate something through the dish in the sink, got something later because I didn't want to use the dirty dish because I'm washing it. I ate something else, I throw it in the sink. Oh my God, two dishes. This is the kind of nonsense. There is no evidence at this point that she had anybody over at her apartment at all. There's no evidence of it. And it also makes very little sense that somebody who was spending the night with her would follow her out and then attack her on the way to the car. It seems a little unreasonable. That just I, I don't I don't see any evidence of that. But it's a good question. Good question. Um <laughs> wait, I have to see this one. Um let's see. Wait, wait, what's this? Oh <laughs> talking about differences in ages. Yeah, I mean a John Van Size could have had a thing for her. I don't he says he didn't. Do I believe him? Not necessarily. But do I believe it'd kill her? He really liked her. Nobody said he was harassing her. You know, if you want to keep the girl in your life, I don't think killing her is the best way to do it. Although, yes, if he became totally obsessed, whether he was stalking in a sense in his own head and said, I, oh, I'll get to, I'll get to some of the other issues on the whole, oh, well, I might as well get to it now. What the heck? Um, so the, the thing is, there's, there's, there's a, there's a couple suspects. Uh, well, there's more than a couple, but let me explain how the suspect list goes. Um, we have, all right, so we have, here we have Jody. Here we have John, who is the number one because he was the one who said he was the last one to see her or see her alive, whichever way you want to look at it. The older man who's a little quirky, uh, who's showing too much interest in her, da, da, da. And then there's this dude. Um, this guy is, who is he? <laughs> For God, um, he's he's a rapist. Okay, he's like a, a three time rapist uh, out of Minneapolis, um, and supposedly he did. He, he, when I was in prison, he made a rap song or something. It said, "Hey, you know, I know where I I did her, I did her, and and her body's in this this place, um, a location called Tipton." So so if you if you look at this map, this guy. Uh, up here is where, where she lives, and down here is Tipton. It's two hours and 49 minutes, but somebody who took her, her body's never been found, had to drive her away somewhere. Did he? Did that person drive away, put her in a river? Did he bury her on a farm? Did he, where was it? So he claimed it was, she was like some, near some silo or something. Eventually they sent some dogs out and they never found anything. He says it's all crap, but he is a three-time rapist, so he's a serial rapist. Serial rapists are oftentimes serial killers. Now you say, well, why would he have anything to do with what happened up here? Well, it's because he was living there at the time. So he could be a serial killer living in her area at the time. He's got, he's, he's obviously a psychopath. He's obviously a serial predator. Did he, did he have a thing for her? Did he watch her on TV? Did he go to one of her churches? Did he live in the apartment? He didn't live in the apartment. I would, they would have known that. We lived in the area. Did he then drive his vehicle in and sit there in the parking lot? I don't know a damn thing about this, Anthony Jackson. Um, 
because again, for whatever reason, so much information on this case is just vague. Could it be him? Yeah, could. Could it be a different serial killer? It absolutely could. Could it be somebody who's not a serial killer but was a stalker who saw her on TV and just sat in that lot day after day? No, her, by the way, unfortunately, her name, her name, her address was in the phone book, and her phone number was in the phone book. She had gotten a few creepy phone calls. She said were, she didn't like. They were nasty. She said she wanted to change her phone number. I don't know if that again has anything to do with anything. I'd love to see every police report, but I don't have any access. But her, her, she was listed in the phone book. So if you see her on TV and you go, Jody Husentrude, which is such an odd name, you know, I mean, let's face it, she's not Jane Smith. Jody Husentrude, I'm going to guess there's one Jody Husentrude in all of that location, Mason City. So the guy goes, oh, look at this. She lives at the Key Apartments. He goes, drives over there and he watches and he sees her coming out and he sees her coming out and he sees her coming out and he says, I'm going to get her one of these mornings. And the morning he was trying to get her, she took a damn sweet time about getting out of the apartment, but he was there. Um, possibly waiting under the eaves, right? When she walked out, he walked her in right behind her and attacked her and then dragged her to his vehicle, which is either next to him, next to her car, or just, just, just where I showed you could just be parked along the side there. Maybe not so close to the road, but more accessible. I don't know. Could it be this guy? Yeah. Could it be a stalker? Absolutely. Could it be a different serial killer? Sure because we don't know. Um, now, the problem the police had was that they had no physical evidence. They had that palm print, which didn't seem to match anybody, and a hair that didn't seem to match anybody. Now, one day, which has already been 28 years, maybe there's DNA that could prove something. But 28 years has gone by and nothing's been proven. This is a problem, okay? <laughs> so, so what happens is, could the police are like, yeah, you know, it could be a serial killer, it could be a stalker, but we ain't got jack on that. But one thing we do have, one thing we do have is this guy. And we know that most people are killed by people who are close to them. And this guy, he's a little sketchy. At least we think he's sketchy. So therefore, we're going after this guy. Now, now John Van Sice, oh Lord. Um his life was freaking ruined, absolutely 100% ruined between the police. He was, he did everything. He gave his DNA. He did a polygraph, supposedly passed twice. Um, he did everything he could. Now, either he's just a psychopath who was just lying us through his little teeth, but or it's just some guy that just liked Jody because she was popular and she was in the media and she was fun and he was having a good time after his divorce and the poor schmuck... <laughs> Happened to see her right before she got killed. And he's an older guy. So he, he by the way, he, he doesn't have, the one thing that was seen was a white van. He doesn't have a white van, he had a blue van. So his vehicle doesn't match. Um, and also the interesting thing about this is there, there's some interesting stories. So um, the woman that I absolutely adore, um, the, the, the investigative, uh, uh, Caroline Lowe. I mean, I, I rarely have love for journalists. I love Caroline Lowe. I do. I know. I like to give credit where credit is due. And it's a first, it's the first time in a long time that I, I've seen a journalist be as good as she is, as thorough as she is, and as honest as she is. I tell you, I love Caroline Lowe. <laughs> I do. Um, and what she was pointing out are some very interesting things about why this guy became a suspect and and um, that yeah he was he, he was a good target he was definitely that but he cooperated 100% with the police in every way shape and form and they never came up with anything now what happened was in 2017 2018 they did some grand jury stuff and brought him in again and and, and also brought in other people uh, to testify. And one of the things that was interesting about this guy was that supposedly uh, she, so Jody goes missing about 4.30 in the morning. And at six o'clock in the morning, he has a friend. It's not the woman he's dating, but it's a, it's the friend of the woman he's dating. 
And she calls him up at six in the morning and says, are we going walking? She wakes him up. Apparently sounds like he's asleep. Now we're talking about, she's calling a home phone as far as I can see. So it's not a cell phone where you're like, um, <laughs> wait a minute. Oh, hi, hon. <laughs> you know, no, I'm at home. <laughs> you know, it's not that. Theoretically, if you're calling a home phone, he's at home. So at six o'clock in the morning, the friend, and I don't know who did any kind of just studies of the, the phones. I mean, you can, you can go to the phone company and find out what phone calls came in. 1995. I don't, again, I, the, the information so crappy, but he was supposed to be home at six in the morning. She wakes him up. She says, are we going, going for a walk at seven? And, and they, that was what they all, that's what they did uh, as a regular, as an exercise thing. Um, so at six o'clock in the morning, supposedly he's at home. If he abducted her at four 30 in the morning, that's a very short period of time for him to, to go and do something to her, which one would assume would be rape. Cause I mean, if you haven't been able to get it all that time, you're finally going to hit it. You're going to do the rape thingy and then you're going to kill her. And then you got to do something with her body. And then you can be home at six in the morning. Now, mind you, there are serial killers who will kill somebody on the way to work, walk into work, get a cup of coffee. And people say, well, he is totally normal. So is it possible? Sure. Is it probable? No. Is it probable this guy who really liked her would, would have gone over there at the early morning hours and sat there to go and kill her? For what reason? I mean, because supposedly um, she turned him down. So he decided he was going to immediately kill her. And not only that, but this guy had, this guy can talk. This guy can schmooze. This guy has things to offer. He's just going to pop up and do a blitz attack in a parking lot. He's not going to say, Hey, Hey, Jody, come on, Jody. You know, I really want to be with you. He's not going to talk to her. He's just going to blitz attack her. That doesn't make sense. So the blitz attack thing really takes him out of the picture along with the fact that he's supposedly home at six in the morning, unless the woman, the friend is lying for him. Why would she be lying for him? That wasn't even the woman he was dating. Why would she be lying? And so the claim is that, you know, they, they did all this investigation of this guy. They came up with zero on him. Uh, he has a, a semi alibi. And then in 17 and 70, and I think 19, 2000, 2017, 2018, they did these grand jury things. And, um, they they wanted GPS's car so they know where his, he would move. He had moved to Arizona, but they wanted to follow his car. I think because they're hoping his car would then show up at the place where he buried her. Well, that never worked out. It's now 2023, so that didn't that didn't happen. And I, I'm listening to that particular program. I was uh, the one I was talking about. Um, not that one. This one. Um, I think they had the uh, police chief, present police chief on there, and he's giving an explanation. Let me see if I can find it, because I thought it was really interesting, because I'm like, clearly they are focused on him. And, but the question is, why are they focused on him? Let me see if I can find that. Um, the working theory. It says here, um, Let's see, we, we, uh, we can move on something uh, if at that point we have enough, essentially. It has to be very well planned in terms of the age of the case and in cooperation with the county attorney. All of the things that we need to happen uh, at this point, we'd have, to be, we'd have to get ready to do everything and be coordinated. This is a police chief saying this. Well, they're not looking at a serial killer. They're not looking at a stalker. They're looking at this guy. They're hoping they can get everything together. They can prove enough to bring this guy in. They said that then, and now it's nothing's happened. They didn't get anything on him. They have a zero on him. It's not his handprint. It's not his hair. There's no proof he was in the parking lot. He had a, a semi alibi at six in the morning. It's not the kind of attack he would have, he would have done. Um, and they've, they've got nothing on him, but that, you know why I think they're going after him? Cause he's the only suspect they have. When you can't figure out what serial killer could be, when you can't figure out what stalker it could be, and I don't know what they've done. I don't know if they checked out the church across the street. I don't know if they checked out. I don't know what they've done because it's all very vague. And so the only suspect they really have that has a face and a name is this John Van Sice. Um, and this poor schmuck, um, he put out this, <laughs> he put out this, um, see if I can find it. he put out this 
Mm, where is it? Uh, is this it? No, that, hold on a second. I got to find it now. I got to find it. Okay, hold on a second. Oh, no. Okay, hold on. Hold on. I'm looking for it. There we go. He put out this, <laughs> he put out this, there's a, uh, you know, carpet in front of his door, doormat that says, go away. He has been harassed to death by the media, harassed to death. And so he keeps trying. He, he said, he, he actually had an interview with this fellow, um, this guy. All right. Steve Ridge. Now, let me tell you who Steve Ridge is. Uh, okay, Steve. Oh, where are you, Steve? All right. Uh, this this report came out in the Sun, which tells you how good it is going to be. Steve Ridge is the investigator. The detective, the family is hired. I got some issues with Steve Ridge, but anyway, the Sun, the most reputable <laughs> rag of uh, the UK, says bombshell new photo shows where missing TV anchor Jody Hustrut had a secret date with a mystery man before vanishing. All right, let me show you this great photo because it's a bombshell photo. It's called Two Chairs and a Lake. All right, Two Chairs and a Lake. <laughs> I've seen more exciting photos in my sleep. All right, P.I. Steve Ridge. Let me give you P.I. Steve Ridge. There he is, P.I. Steve Ridge. Spoke exclusively to the U.S. Sun. Really? Okay. About discovering. Why? And if you're going to speak to somebody, don't speak to the Sun. All right. Because they've already... Mm, I'm okay at that. Anyway, about discovering who's in truth's final fling. Her final fling. And shared a bombshell picture of the setting of her final date. Oh, my God. I mean, it's appalling. Anyway. So, anyway, it says here that Ridge revealed information to the U.S. Sun that had previously been only privy to the police and FBI and never made public about Houston Truth's final date. Through my digging, I learned that Jody had a very secret final fling with a man she had just met 10 days before she went missing. Secret final fling. What a secret. What? She didn't announce to the entire freaking world that she met somebody and went on a date with him? Uh, she is a celebrity person. Maybe she just didn't really want to spread this around. Maybe she didn't want to talk about somebody, you know, until she knew if it was anything worthwhile talking about. The man was from out of state, but was staying in a home on Clear Lake, which is fairly close to the location where he, when he met the 27 year old in a bar. Okay. So she hooked up with this dude, supposedly, and I don't know if any of this is true in a bar, uh, met this guy. Um, and mind you, she's looking for she's looking for some job that's no longer in Iowa. She wants to go any place, any place in the country that'll give her a better better deal. Just keep that in mind. An intense relationship blossomed, in which they saw each other almost daily for a week. I don't know if that's true. Rich said that the pair spoke quote just about every day, and she initiated the calls. She's stalking him. <laughs> The night that they first met, it was a very fast connection. Are we talking sex? Is that what your fast connection is? Ridge secured a meeting with a mystery man and got a tour of the secluded home where he stayed while in Mason City. That home is the last place Jody went on a date. And there's all things around the date. Why? When, before she went missing. Five days before she went missing, the popular TV anchor met this man for a date at his home where they, oh my God, sat on the back deck having drinks overlooking the lake. That is shocking. During his visit to the property, Rich took a photograph at the exact spot because this dude's one hell of an investigator. Uh, um, <laughs> no, I don't know. This could be the sun making up bullshit. Bull crap and stay. this guy's not so bad after all, but the sun is blowing it all up out of proportion from maybe a, a, a five minute conversation. Uh, anyway, I took a photograph of the exact spot where the pair had their lot, their final meeting and evening together before she went missing. Of the photograph, he said, This picture looking out the window at the chairs where they last sat. It's a powerful picture. No, it's a picture of two chairs on a lake. <laughs> I don't know what's powerful about it. Two chairs on a lake. All right. Jody had not told even her closest friend about the relationship, maybe because it wasn't that big a deal. The man who has not been identified by the investigator said that he and the television anchor had an immediate attraction and bond. 
And, and according to the man, they both foresaw a long-term relationship, even though she had no idea where she was going to be living because she was willing to go any place in the United States for her career. All right. She supposedly never told her. He's, and she, who's in truth? Allegedly. Allegedly. Who the hell alleged anything? <laughs> what? This guy she knew for a week? Or, or is it, or is it the P.I.? allegedly never told her close friends or family about the relationship in order to stave off any unwanted drama. Who would know that except Jude, Jody? Oh, he had, oh, this is where it gets interesting. He added, this is the, the PI. Let me put his picture up here again. Whoops, that's not him. I'm oh, sorry. That's not, okay. Where is he? Oh yeah, that's a bad picture. Of him. This is the good picture. Of him. Jen, this is Steve Ridge. This is another picture. of him. He looks like crap there, but you know, I know how that works out. Um, He's now offering $25,000 extra dollars, uh, so make a $50,000 reward for any information to find her body, supposedly not to even get information on who did it, but to find her body. Anyway, let, let me give you this good picture. Okay, that's a nicer picture. Anyway, then he says this. He added that Jody had strong admirers. The cold case murder investigator has been working on the bizarre missing person case for years and has no doubt, no doubt that jealousy played a role in Jody's demise. The mystery man was simply in the wrong place at the wrong time in Jody's life. But the investigator is adamant that this final fling played a key role in Houston Truth's disappearance. I am certain that his quickly blossoming relationship with Jody played a central role in her abduction days later. I believe without a doubt that this relationship was clearly a factor in what was happening because this was not a random act of violence. It was not, and it wasn't anything like that. It wasn't a stalker that came out of nowhere, which he has no freaking clue. This clearly was someone she knew and had interacted with, who was very aware of all of the relationships or people that she saw. And so that's why this is a kind of sensitive information. Although I'm just basically telling you, I think John did it. According to Ridge, the police looked at this so-called mystery man as a potential person of interest and put him under and put him under surveillance. They scoped out, uh, they even scooped up his street side garbage for examination, but the man was then cleared. Despite this, the investigator warned that identification of this man could jeopardize an eventual prosecution in this case. Because if this man was the one that inspired some other man to do something bad, it has nothing to do with a stalker or a serial killer. Uh, for, so basically it said that he's a, a salesman. No, uh, oh, that's all a bunch of crap here. Um, I think that third part is also another threat because of relationship with Jody. Now he's talking about the car salesman. Oh, it's a nonsense. Anyway, he eventually, interesting enough, this guy eventually does talk to John Van Sice and he gives one interview to him and says, this is all nonsense. This is, I'm going to give one interview and that's it. And, and he says, well, I'm not saying I'm on his side, but I'm just letting you know what he said. So the police clearly are focused on John. Uh, clearly these the private investigators focused on John because they don't have anybody else. If it's a serial killer, they simply have no freaking clue, which is often true with serial killers. And if it's a stalker, they still have no clue. In other words, they just don't know. So they they got this guy, a face and a name, without any actual information, actual evidence that links him to the crime or any good motive. Boy, he, he was She was hooking up with somebody else. She was finally finding somebody. So he's going to go kill her. So theoretically, I guess that's it. So John, you see here, um, he liked her a lot and he kept it all on the down low. And she wasn't really seeing anybody. But when she hooked up with this guy, she met him at a bar and he, he knew about it. And she was all like into this other guy. He's like, oh my God, I'm losing her to somebody else. So somehow he knew about this and he knew about how into, into this guy she was. So he's like, I, I, I got this one last chance to, to show her this, this tape. And while I was there, I said, what about this dude? And she said, oh yeah, I'm really into him. And he goes, well, what about me? She goes, not you, you're old, you're an old dude. I'm into the younger guy. And so he said, well, I'm losing her forever. So therefore he decided that next morning when she left home, he would get her, he would finally have sex with her 
and he will be the last person to be with her, which is kind of a stalkerish kind of thing. Could it be true? Sure. Is it likely? No. Is there any evidence of it? No. And yeah, so if you, if I were working this case, would I have him on the suspect list? Well, of course, I'd have to have him on the suspect list because he was connected with her. I I, I would have I would I don't know what I'd have to talk to the woman who said she was walking with him and called him and and check out all these other things. Oh, let me tell you another weird thing that happened. So this woman, remember the uh, yeah a Amy Coons. So Amy Coons now says in this in this uh, in this uh, news News Nation thing that he John called on the morning that uh, Jody went missing, called early. And so is Jody there? And she says, no, she's not here. And, and wh why are you calling here at the station? You know, like at this time of day, and that was really freaky. Why would he do that? Well, the interesting thing is he ne she never said anything about that actually happening until last year. So in other words, for 20, how many years? Are that? <laughs> uh, many, many, over two and a half decades, she never mentioned that John called the studio in the morning. And suddenly, and within the last year, she says he did. And I, and, and again, one of the reasons I absolutely love Caroline, Caroline Lowe is because she said, well, that's rather conflicting information from what I know. In other words, I never heard this before in two dec more than two decades. And suddenly, the producer suddenly says he called that morning. Why? Did, why was that like not known for two decades? Why would she suddenly come up with that? Did she suddenly remember it or is she suddenly trying to think he did it? So she's saying some other things. So you, you have a lot of this misinformation, confusing information, stuff that doesn't make sense. Um, I don't see that there's evidence that he committed this crime or a motive that he committed this crime, um, except for what, you know, the new, new detect, the new uh, PI says that, Oh, he must've known about this little fling she was having and decided to offer. But the, fact that it was a blitz attack in the parking lot leans away from him the, and also the fact that and what the profile is if you if you go if you go to the um uh that the site the jody site uh link below uh you will see that the, the fbi profiles talked about this and i thought they did a good job on this one aspect they talked about the fact that when you commit a crime you you you, ha you have opportunities to do things in one way or the other this guy had many opportunities to get Jody in a situation where he could do her in without blitz attacking her in a parking lot. I mean, blitz attacking in a parking lot is, first of all, your car, your vehicle is going to be the same. You might be the same. Um, and you're connected. So why would you blitz attack in a parking lot? Why wouldn't you say, hey, Jody, um, meet me down at whatever. And, and, and whatever, you know, she just disappears. Why would you blitz attack her? Where, by the way, he used to live at that location. He actually lived in that apartment house like prior to that meeting, before they even knew each other. He does know the place, and he knows the, the manager of the place. The people there would recognize him. So, I mean, it's like kind of risky, you know, to do that when you have all these other possibilities because uh, you have so much access to her. So that you would do this is, is kind of doesn't make sense. Um a blitz attack is something done by a person who is not going to be recognized. His vehicle is probably not going to be recognized. Um, <coughs> so, yeah. But somebody who clearly knows she's coming and going from there. There's definitely somebody who's been watching her. There's no question about that. And does he know that she would leave at that time in the morning? Well, yes, he would know that. That is true. But is that the kind of thing he would pull off? Why would he do it that way? It just makes no sense. And not even speak to her. Um, it, it's odd. Now, I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm just saying it's odd and and the woman who was walking with him would be lying and he'd have to, if she wasn't lying, then he'd have to be committing this crime in a very short span of time and getting rid of her body. I don't know that there's anything other than the fact that there's an older guy who spent time with her that links him to the crime at all. Um, <laughs> if she'd gone to his house and disappeared, that would be something different. But she went home. She was home. She was woken up by her producer. She said she was on her way to a car, and she was on the way to the car. 
so I don't think it's him. I, I have no good reason to believe it's him. I have more reason to believe it's a stalker or a serial killer, but I have no clue which one because I'm not involved in the case. So that's, that's where I'd stand on this. And, and that's why this case is so difficult to, to assume anything on because the crime scene photos are crap. I can't find a sketch. I can't find any police reports. I got no clue, you know, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> something in my throat. Okay. I'm going to check your comments here. <coughs> mm, okay. All right. Now let's see what you have to say. Oh my goodness. All right. So many comments. I'm sure. Um, so let's see what we have here. Good commentary. Jill, hi. Someone with a friendship with Jody would not have to ambush her in a place where he could be seen. Yes, that seems to be reasonable. Now, whenever you're investigating a case, if I were profiling the case, would I put him at the top of the suspect list? No, I would not. I would not. But would I put him on the suspect list? Yes, I would have to. I would say, okay, uh, detectives, here's what I'm saying. It, he will be unlikely to do an ambush. I just, I find this very strange that he would do an ambush in a place he was known that it, it, when he has other ways to do it. I, I don't buy it. Usually when you have a, a spurned lover type of thing, you have them begging to be, let's go someplace and have a chit chat or one last chance. Let's go for camping. <laughs> let's go camping and you won't come back. That kind of thing. You don't usually have a blitz attack in a parking lot. That's just bizarre um, for this kind of guy. I would not have him at the top. I'd have him on the just down here, just in case, you know, because you, you know, human beings can do things that are completely anomalies, and you can't completely eliminate somebody if you cannot. Now he's got a pretty decent semi alibi, but again, it's not a full alibi. So, yeah, um, I'd keep him on the list, but I think the, the you know the, the excessive pressure that he's the guy that did it by. Uh, the, the police and the PI, unless they know something, which we all don't know, but they haven't come up with anything on the guy. I think they just think he's weird. And sometimes that's good enough because if they have nobody else, they got zip. They don't know where the body is. They don't have any uh, phys, uh, DNA evidence. They just don't know who the heck it is. And therefore go for the guy who got, a, again, a face and a name. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, um, oh, Clarissa, uh, you say they just don't want to believe that Jody and John were friends, period. Uh, apparently, she didn't lead them on. She said they were just friends. It was platonic. Everybody around them said it was platonic. Now, somebody once said in a certain movie that there's no way... You know, women and men can be friends. And to some extent, I agree with that um, because it's very hard for a female to be platonic with a guy unless she, he just thinks she's like repulsive. <laughs> repulsive might work, but she was not repulsive. So a guy who's 20 years older, I'm going to say he could be definitely interested. Definitely. I don't care what he says. <laughs> I don't even know if it's just bull crap what he says because from what I what I've seen, guys love women twenty years younger. That's just what I know. So uh, yeah, uh, they can be platonic. It could just be a guy who's just a fun guy who just and again she's a celebrity and so he's just enjoying being with all the younger people. I mean I enjoy that myself. My my uh, my daughter, you know, she's a daughter and son-in-law. They're in their forties. He's about his age actually, um, and they have friends that. Um, that come over and we hang out together and I love being around them. They are 20 years younger than me, but they're, they're vibrant. They, 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 they make jokes that I, I just really enjoy. I enjoy being with people 40, 20 years younger than me. It's been, it's great. And why is that? Is it because I'm got a, a screwed up mind or is it because I enjoy the freshness of a different uh, generation of people? Maybe he does too. He's we've been married for many years. Now he's got this new bar life and he's laughing and joking and he's meeting people who are younger and making him feel alive. Doesn't mean he's necessarily, you know, necessarily thinking he's going to hook up with her. I'm just saying it's not impossible that he thinks that, but also he could just be enjoying himself in that whole venue. Um, let's see. 
Oh, yeah, the boat thing. Yeah, she could have just fallen off a boat. You know, we were boating and she fell in the water and she drowned. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that is a crime. You know, I didn't look at that shirt before, but oh my God, you are so right. That is a crime. <laughs> oh my God, that is terrible. Oof. Yes, that is for sure. Um, let's see. Oh, Charlotte's leaving us. Let's see. Um, yes, a, a def an experienced defense attorney would advise him not to give any statement or polygraph. And apparently he did too. And according to, they supposedly passed them. That's all I know. But I don't know much. So there you go. Um, but he took he took them and he... He was he he was willing to do it. He was very cooperative. But now, you mind you, there there are some people who are guilty who are cooperative. So again, you have to when you're doing investigations, which is why I call what I what I would do. Now, mind you, what I'm doing here is educational educational profiling, just to help people understand how profiling would think their way through an investigation. But if I were working with the police, I do what I call investigative criminal profiling. The purpose of that is to, to work with the police, the detectives on the case, to help them come up with the best avenues of investigation. Nothing's absolute. As information comes in, as you learn more things, it's a fluid situation. So anybody who thinks that, you know, you just, you know, do one of these, uh, what, what is it, Johnny Carson, <laughs> the great Karnak, I know it's John <laughs> because blah, 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 blah. You know, no, that's all nonsense. And, and, and it shouldn't be misrepresented as that. Now, mind you, I want to say this about the profiles that I heard on the, uh, the, the, the show. Um, I was actually pleased. I'm not real fond of FBI profiling, but as I pointed out, I'm not against FBI profilers. I just find that a lot of the big, big wigs have often misrepresented profiling in a very, disastrous ma ma manner. Uh, but these people who were on the show, I thought were pretty reasonable. So I was happy with that. I am always happy when I see um, stuff being uh, explained in a way that I think is, is good. I mean, you know, because uh, the more information we have out in the public that is good information and not a bunch of nonsense makes me happy. It does. Um, let's see. <laughs> put the journalist who wrote this in jail. Are you talking about the son? Remember, the son had to apologize to me for their slander. Well, you know, um, let's see. Uh, um, <laughs> Loretta says, if I'm not sure about facts, I double check if possible. <laughs> the son <laughs> does not everyone. Oh, my God. Yeah, and the sun is absolutely one of the freaking worst. I mean, they are just abysmal, um, abysmal. Um, if, if, if you know, there's there's tabloids. I explain this to people, and I, they, most people don't believe this crap, but they should because I'm I'm telling you the truth. But there are tabloids, and there are tabloids. The Daily Mail, which many people call the Daily Fail, is actually one of the best uh, best pieces. They do a lot of crap, mind you. But as far as crime goes, they are what they are what I go to first to find out information about anything about crime. I will actually put in the name of the case and put in Daily Mail. I don't know. They got some journalists there, or at least reporters, who do some work. I, I, I'm not okay, sure I understand it, but there's a lot of stuff that I'm not saying everything they do is good. But they are one of the top places where I get information for the details on crimes, and usually I find out that they're not incorrect. Uh, the second best place back in my day when I was doing television was the National Enquirer, which also people can't fathom because National Enquirer has been known to have like babies with five heads and Martian babies. <laughs> it's a like weird crap. It was, at the, it was at the checkout line right before you got to the register. It's a horrible tabloid, National Enquirer. But they were the one people that when they, they did crime, they did crime extremely well. And they actually did investigative journalism. And I that was one of the few people I was willing to talk to. They even paid me, which was unusual for any, you know, usually you just waste your time and then you get misquoted. They actually put in full, full, when I did interviews, they gave 
my almost a full interview in the National Enquirer. It was actually stunning. I had, I had a, a one one investigator journalist over there. I just thought he was great. So go figure. I mean, so you don't don't assume that just because they're crappy in one way, they're always crappy in another. So go figure. But the, the National Enquirer and the Daily Mail are actually two of the better crime outlets out there. The Sun is 100% on the, the, at the bottom, like totally at the bottom. I have nothing nice to say about the Sun. The Sun is garbage, 100% garbage. I would never do an interview for them. Uh, I don't interview for anybody anymore, but you know, I would never do one for them. Um, let's see. Uh, Olga. Hi, Olga. Uh, with the guy. That's why they don't care about it being quick. She knew him. And they got into a fight in the parking lot. He hits her and grabs her. What? Uh, they didn't get into a fight in the parking lot. Um, just to be sure, to, to understand this. The key was bent. Um, so there was only 12 steps from the, 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 the place to the car. And whoever attacked her, the, the, the mirror was also pushed back. It was an attack. It was a blitz attack. There was no, there, I, people call it a fight. I don't think there was a fight. Let me go back and just show you. I, I don't think there was a fight in the parking lot. I think it was a blitz attack. That is, uh, no, sorry. Where the hell is it? Um, I'm just trying to find. Okay. I think it was a 100% blitz attack. A blitz attack is not a fight. A fight is where you grab somebody like by the arm and then you fight and then they, they throw things and then they kick and all that crap goes on. I don't think any of that happened. I think she came out 12 steps to the car. The guy, she got the key in there. He had to be behind her. So as she put the key in there, he had to attack her at that point. And that, that, that's what caused the, the mirror to be pushed because she was pushed uh, from behind. So the key bent. She whacked into the mirror and, and at that point she dropped her stuff, whatever that stuff was. And it's very confusing what it was. Um, and then he, then he grabbed her and dragged her off. Now, whether she, he dragged her unconscious or dragged her conscious, I think he dragged her unconscious. And if she wasn't unconscious, I think he made her unconscious really quick. There was no fight. There was a blitz attack. It's two different things. Um, so it wasn't, they had an argument in the parking lot. She said, hey, get away from me. I'm trying to get ready. No, it wasn't that kind of thing. I don't think there was a discussion. I th she was in a rush to get to that vehicle. Um, let me, let me think. Let me just stop to think, just to be fair. Could, could she be rushing to the vehicle, get to the vehicle, put a thing in there. And then they had, somebody said, hey, why aren't you talking to me? Why are you treating me like this? And they had an argument while she was holding her key in the, they had an argument and then they start then then he pushed her. Well, um, I can't I, I, will, I will say this to be fair. Um, I can't say that absolutely 100 percent couldn't happen. So in theory, could somebody want to have a chit chat on the way out to the car? It seems to me, here's the problem. I think I think you have a reasonable point. I just want to point that out because sometimes people are reasonable. Uh, Olga, I think you make a reasonable possibility uh, as to somebody had to go talk to her. But why why would he try to talk to her at have a conversation as she's leaving for work? Is that really necessary? In other words, another if he was like getting bummed about her. Did he need to do that at that point in time at 3.30 in the morning? Oh, well, she wasn't there at 3.30, four or some in the morning. So he's pissed off by then because she didn't come out. Um, is that when he would need to talk to her? Could he talk to her at his home? Could he talk to her after work? Could he talk to her at a bar? Could it happen? Yes. And, and, and it's important not to eliminate something entirely. When, it, when, when I think it through, could it have happened that way? Yes. Um, then he would have his own vehicle there. Uh, I don't know where he'd park the vehicle. This is one of the questions. He had a blue, by the way, John had a blue van. He didn't have a white van. So if that was an issue, the white van issue, and I don't know that that's accurate. Um, he, he could have pulled up. He could have pulled up here by the building 
waiting for her to come out. She comes out, he runs up, he jumps out of the car and says, Hey, what's, what's going on? Um, like, why, why, um, why won't you be with me? Well, why do you want the little guy? Um, and she says, buzz off. I got to get to work. And he loses his temper and he shoves, he hits her and she whack, she drops everything. And then he decides he's going to drag her off to the van and uh, his blue van and um, take her someplace and rape her and kill her, bury her body and then get back by six in the morning. Could it happen? Yeah. I think that's why he's on the suspect list because one thing you don't want to do is eliminate somebody from the suspect list unless you can absolutely 100% prove they have an alibi. And I've said this over and over again. What's an alibi? Uh, an alibi is the guy's out of the country. <laughs> an alibi is the guy's in jail. An alibi is the guy's in the ICU. An alibi is he's, he's a pastor. He's, giving, he's, he's, he's standing at the pulpit giving a, a speech at the time the person was killed. These are 100% alibis. What's a bad alibi? I'm home. I was home sleeping. Second bad alibi. I was home sleeping with my girlfriend. Third alibi. Well, you know, my my friend called me at six in the morning. She says I was there. Uh, now that's a better alibi than the girlfriend or sleeping alone, because at least you have a person who's got no real good real good reason to to, to lie for you. Um, mommy will lie for you. Your wife will lie for you. Your girlfriend will lie for you. You got to be careful of those. But I don't know why a, a friend who walk takes walks with them would lie. I mean, I've, I I used to have a walking partner. There's no way in hell I'd lie for him. <laughs> you know what I mean? Somebody said, where was he at this point? I'm not, I wasn't with him. I'm not going to lie for that guy. He's my, my walking partner. He's not my boyfriend. So he, he has a reasonable partial alibi that it would seem unlikely that he could have committed the crime in the time frame. Um, not impossible. Which is why, again, he has to remain on the list. But I think, I think, Olga, I think I'm pleased you came up with a scenario because I didn't bring up that scenario. And one of the important things about people um, being open, uh, even profilers, um, and to have group group thinking, is because sometimes we won't see something some a way somebody else will see it, and then you start thinking about it. And you go, you know, that's possible. I overlooked that. It's possible. So, Ova, I appreciate that. I think that was good. Um, <laughs> Texas Red says, my, uh, my front door sign says, go away. I go on get. And you haven't even been harassed by the media, I don't think, as far as I know, anyway. Mm, yeah, I don't know. Um, uh, and, and says, yes, Charlotte, I heard he, she met someone 10 days before. He's never been named. His lawyer advised him not to do a lie detector. You know, if, if he was, if he was, if he was getting it on with her or was having a future relationship again, why is this guy going to go out and kill her? I mean, and this guy, I, did he know where she lived? Did he sit outside her home for days on end? Because somebody had to know, Oh, I, I forgot to mention this. Darn it. It, what's more important than her her movements when she comes out and goes to work is an important movement but the other more important movement which i wish i mentioned like an hour ago before people decided to quit watching the video is you not only have to know her movements you have to know who else in that building 73 people as far as i know come out at that time because you don't want to be committing a crime at the time when five people exit their apartments to go to their vehicles. You want to be sure that at that point in time, that it's pretty damn well quiet, dead quiet. You Otherwise, you're not going to take the chance. I mean, would you do this at seven in the morning? Probably not because you know people are going on the way to work. Too, much, too many witnesses. So you would want to watch quite a few nights and say at, at 3.30 in the morning, normally she comes out by herself and I sit here and watch, and there's nobody else in that parking lot. Nobody else comes out of the house. She leaves, and there's still like 50 minutes before, 50 minutes after, I don't see a person moving. You'd want to know that. That's why I think the person had to have knowledge, a reasonable, reasonably long knowledge of who is coming and going from that parking lot. 
again, John Van Sice, he did live there. So theoretically he could know that, but, uh, but if he was running a, a normal schedule, why would he know that? He didn't know, he did not know Jody when he lived there. So if he's going on his regular schedule and he wasn't a person who got up at 3.30 in the morning to go to work, he would have no freaking clue who got, who was moving around at three to three to five in the morning. He would have no idea. He would have to be stalking and there's no evidence he was stalking. So again, the, he would have to have, everything was great up until that moment. And then he decided I'm pissed. And he went there and took a major, major chance. I had no clue whether at that moment, and it's possible he could have pulled up and just to talk to her and she pissed him off and he grabbed her and threw her in his van and he just got lucky. It is possible. But it's also possible somebody else was watching day after day, at least a few days in a row, or they lived there, or they were stalking her, or they were a serial killer who, who knows? Now, again, that's why John Van Sice is still on the radar, although no, nothing's ever been, they've never come up with any proof whatsoever. Um, so, um, but... I don't know. I mean, you, ha you I can't say, I, I have no real good evidence that he, it was connected to this crime. I don't. Um, so some, some cases where I go pretty sure that he like, he should be the number one suspect for many, many good reasons. In this case, I don't put him as a number one suspect. I just put him on the list because you can't take him off of the list. So that would be more my theory on that. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, you think uh, John doesn't fit? I thought you thought maybe he did fit. Uh, oh, that was Olga, not Harper. <laughs> um, uh, let me go down to the bottom here. Um, so many comments, there's been hundreds. Um, um, yeah, Harper, you're correct. Uh, Unless they find the body and have DNA, they have zero DNA, as far as I know. I don't know that that hair that they found was connected, or whether they had a root on the hair, um, or had anything that really worked. Uh, they have a handprint, which is useful. I mean, here's the point about a handprint: it's not John's handprint. That's obvious, because if it were John's handprint, they think they might have arrested him. Now, mind you, John would not be guilty because his handprint was on the vehicle. He knew her. She, she drove, drives up. He walks her to her car. Okay. You've seen the video. That's cool. Okay, honey. Um, get, get, let you get on home to go to sleep. Cause you got to get up early tomorrow morning. And he puts his hand on the car. That doesn't make him a kill. So John's hand on the car actually is not very useful. However, his hand was that handprint wasn't his. Now, remember that other fellow, the one from Minnesota, apparently it's not his handprint either. But if let's let's say, for example, it was his handprint. OK, let's, let's put him up here. Let's say it was Anthony's handprint. What the hell would a serial rapist handprint be doing on her car? Now you got a suspect. Now you got a number one suspect. There, this guy would probably be the guy because it would be hard to explain. Now, is it possible Andrew Jackson was visiting a friend in the complex and was walking by an accident and put his hand on the vehicle? Sure. It's possible. Is it likely? No. So he would become number one suspect if his handprint was on there. Um, he doesn't seem to have any hair, so I don't know if he left any hair. <laughs> but so the handprint, if the handprint matches somebody and has to match somebody who has no reason to have his handprint there, so if you end up with a serial killer whose handprint matches, or let's say a guy from that church across the street, let's say the guy from the, some guy was going to the church across the street and they realized he was kind of creepy and he has a white van and his handprint's on the car. Now you got a good suspect. So he'd be a stalker and his handprint shouldn't be there. That would be great. That would be excellent. So, or if you have a serial killer who is in prison for 10, 10 serial homicides, and it turns out he like, there is a railroad near, near, near this, this area uh, that she, that the, uh, if you go back to um, where her, uh, the location of her, uh, I don't have a good picture of it. So anyway, near this location, there is a railroad somewhere on that street. <laughs> So let's say some guy jumps railroads and he's 
got a whole history of serial homicide. And it turns out that he was in that town at that time as handprints on her car. He's a serial killer. That would be good. But they don't have anybody that matches a handprint. So it's either some person that doesn't matter uh, or it is the killer and it's not John Smith, John Van Syce. So uh, it's really hard to say, but they don't have anything. They don't. And if they find her body, that would be useful. Finding a body, um, it's useful in the sense that, A, where, where was the body found? If the body is found on somebody's property or, you know, if you go bury the body on your uncle's property, that usually is a good clue. Like, let's say an hour away, a body is found on the uncle at uh, the property that belongs to Van, uh, Van Sice's uncle. <laughs> I think you might think it's John Van Sice. Or if it's, you know, somebody else's property who lived, let's say somebody who lived in that apartment complex. Turns out it's their relative's property. That is very interesting. That would be useful information. Um, if you find her body buried underneath somebody's garden, uh, under their under their uh, their 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 new deck, <laughs> whatever. Obviously, if it's on their property, that's important. Um, or if they dump them someplace where, let's say, John has a boat, so they find her body wrapped up and dumped in the water near a place where he normally moors his boat. That would be interesting. Uh, or if they find her body, and when they find her body, there is DNA that matches the killer. That would be fantastic. But they've never found her body in all these years. And who, it, it, you know, if you, if you look at the location, it's massive farmland. I mean, you got this little city, Mason City, and then you got a farmland. So there's so many places to bury a body. It's just ridiculous. So unless they get lucky, and they haven't been lucky in how many years now? 27, 28 years. They haven't been lucky. That sucks. That really is. Um, uh, Clarissa says, body is usually found closer than they think. Generally speaking, people are, you know, they go, uh, they, if you have a body, this is very true, that when, when you get a body in your vehicle and you do something to somebody, you now realize that anybody can catch you with the body in the vehicle. In other words, if you're driving along, God help you if the police pull you over for some, like your taillights out and, and they find a body in your car. So every, when you get in the car and you're driving with a body, you're panicked the whole time because you think, oh my God, what if the, you know, you feel like all the eyes are on you, you know, I'm driving with a body. Ten, the tendency is to go where, you know, you can get rid of the body and nobody's going to see you. So someplace you're familiar with, um, usually, if, usually the body is found. So you'll find like, let's say, you know, there's a lane over here and there's no kids or like. There's nobody down at the end of the lane smoking weed. You know, it's just empty. So you and you dump the body and then you get the hell out of there. That's usually what you do. And eventually the body's found, but nobody saw who dumped it. Um, a body hasn't been found. So it wasn't this. This is not a place. It's a very flat area. Iowa. So you were not talking about ravines being tossed off of mountains. There are there are rivers and lakes. And there's a lot of farms. So is the body buried someplace is the question. And if the body's buried someplace, you're not going to bury the body on somebody else's property where you feel like they're, you know, it's going to be found. So it's a good question. It's a good question. Now, some people will drive away with a body when, when they, they, they feel like they have to get out of town, cross the, you know, that's what the, that's what the, uh, I think the whole, issue about trying to figure out whether John Van Sice crossed into Minnesota or something and got rid of the body there um, or whether somebody else did not, they weren't, they're not looking at anybody else, but somebody else could have no, no, some area far away and be willing to take that drive. It's hard. It's really hard to say. Um, there's more tendencies to do this, but it doesn't mean there's not a person who's willing to do that. Um, well, Madeline McCann, um, is an interesting problem because, of course, you have the two theories, which is Madeleine McCann was kidnapped by some child pedophile uh, and taken someplace and buried someplace where that person was familiar with. Or Madeleine McCann died at the uh, in the apartment and the parents did something with her and they were new to the area. So 
it's only limited places where they would be able to put her and she's never been found. So that's very interesting because usually people who are new to an area, it's hard to get rid of a body because you don't know where to put the body. I did find an area which I, is my number one thought as to where the body is. Um, but and it's an isolated, desolate area, uh, which was where Jerry's phone pinged. However, these things are, they're very, they're a little bit, you know, it's always amazing when they don't find a body. Um, now, the more difficult the landscape, the more, the less likely you are to find bodies. Uh, ravines are great places because nobody goes down in ravines. You know, so if you can dump a body off a ravine and then it's, you know, goes down there and eventually the animals get to it and all that, you're in a good shape. Um but if you don't have a ravine, if you got flat land, you you you, you got it. You got issues. You usually have to bury, and you have to do a bit of work. So, and it doesn't mean you can't move the body, mind you. You can put the body someplace, go about your business, and then move the body later. But it all depends on how, what the police presence is and what you, you know, and whether you're noticed. It's like all of a sudden you like shoot out of state the day after the murder, you know, or the disappearance is a little suspicious. Um, so. It's, it's, um, yeah, it, oh, you said there's a, there are large bodies of water. Well, bodies of water are useful. Definitely. Oh, you, if you can, if you, uh, amazing how many bodies can be, um, weighted down enough not, not to resurface. <clears throat> and so that is a good place. And sometimes those bodies don't resurface for decades. Um, so that's a possibility. It's hard to say, uh, but they haven't found her. So it's, it's, um, it, it, it's 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 a it's a frustrating case that um, people think that there there should be an easier answer too. However, the problem that exists is that since there is no physical evidence, um, really, except for the handprint that hasn't matched anybody that they that they know what it is, um, the focus, generally speaking, is on John Van Sice because he's the only one that's a known a known person. And if, if he's guilty, well, then he deserved all the hell he's gotten for all these years. But if he's not guilty, it's been a pretty sucky deal for him. I mean, you know, he uh, befriended a, a young woman and had fun and then uh, terrible things happen. And then he's a suspect for the rest of his life. That does suck. Um, <laughs> so I don't know, you know, he, he claims now he's getting his early out has some early Alzheimer's gone. So maybe he'll forget about this case pretty soon and won't be an issue for him anymore. But um, it's, 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 it'll be interesting to see what this case is ever solved. I think it all will depend 100% on the two things. If her body is found, there might be a chance. And if the handprint is identified, those are the only two things I can come up with that would actually put this, this case to bed. Um, other than that, um, there's only so far you can go with this. Um, and I say there's three scenarios again, somebody who, uh, uh, a, a person who was, his feelings were hurt in their relationship. That would be John, um, a stalker, which is very possible or serial killer, which is very possible. And if anybody thinks you can look at this case and just from the, what happened in the parking lot, come up with an absolute conclusion and things prof a profiler can do that, they're wrong. They're simply not true. <laughs> and I don't promote a bunch of nonsense. So again, profiling is an ongoing, ongoing methodology to analyze evidence and as it comes in. And the more evidence you have, the better job you can do. And since in this case, I have almost zero for anything useful. I can't even figure out the crime scene photos. I don't know if there's two shoes or one shoe. I don't know where anything is. Uh, the, the, the photos are dreadful. Um, and there's so little actual information. Now, I don't, you know, I, I say if I if I were invited in, this is one case, I swear to God, if I were invited in by Mason City, I'd be there. I'd be there. Free of charge. I I, I think I would. I think because I, you know, I, I go there just to go through all the, the information they have, to look at the real crime scene photos, to actually go to this location, which I can see here pretty well from the maps and all that, but I want to be there in person to see how big the parking lot is. Um, I would like to, I, I would, if I could access all of that, I would do it. I don't, I don't, I don't do much pro bono stuff anymore um, because most times it's a waste of time. Um, and, you know, 
I've worked for police departments where I've come, to, I've actually come with what I believe is is a correct, uh, correct analysis. And because they can't arrest anybody, it's too late that they just hide what I've done and say thank you very much. And then there's, <laughs> they're not gonna, they're not gonna say, oh, Pat Brown solved that case. You're not gonna say that because it's not very, you know, it's not gonna be useful for them to do that. And I don't blame them. I get what they're, I get where they're coming from. Um, uh, in this case. I mean, I've reached, I've been, I'm very curious about, I'm curious why they're after John Van Sice to the level they are or whether that he's just the only, only suspect they have. Um, I'd be very curious. I mean, I don't, I'm not ruling him out, um, but this is one case. Mason City wants to call me. I think I, I, I think I might fly out to Iowa. Maybe not in the winter. <laughs> call me in the spring. Call me in the spring. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, that's what those are my thoughts on this case. Uh, um, let me see what your thoughts are as I take off here. Um, no, yes, it's five fifteen. Time to go. Um, so, thank you all for being here. Um, uh, I, I wasn't really planning to do any more on this case. I did during the hangout when I did discuss it in a, a le lesser amount of time. But I did think there's a lot of interesting things, and I kept getting a re repeat request for this case. So, I thought I'd go ahead and do it. <laughs> Well, maybe John has the creep factor. Well, he may have, but according to the people around him, they didn't think he was creepy. The friends that were hanging around her thought he was a perfectly great guy. So I don't know where the creep factor is. I'm not even absolutely sure about that. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Pat. Love you and your shows. Oh, thank you, Lisa. Ass. I appreciate that. Thank you, everybody. Oh, I love all of you guys being here. Bye, Clarissa. Bye, Loretta. Uh, you sure solved the Ketty Cabin case. All right, go check out the Ketty Cabin pay case, please. I, I appreciate that. I don't know that I did, but I thought of it. I saw it very differently from a whole lot of other people. So, yeah. Um, so anyway, let, let, me, let me go because I think my my time on here, if I run over anymore, then what will happen is I, I'm running out of space on my, <laughs> on my, on my uh, StreamYard account and then it won't. The, the, whole, the whole show will disappear. So I better run away. Anyway, if you're new to the channel, again, do like and subscribe. It makes a huge difference. Uh, it really does. Um, please do that because it keeps the channel going. And I thank you for being here. And I'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.